Pokemon as a franchise has inspired a multitude of generations in a variety of ways. When the series began as an interesting take on a traditional turn-based RPG, it became a gigantic part of people's childhoods everywhere. But it wasn't the games that made the franchise as big as it is. It was the anime, the card game, and most importantly, the merch. And while the games continued to slowly improve their various systems, graphics, and so on, it was these other factors that drove the Pokémon company to where it is today. Pokémon seemed to become less of a gaming passion for the developers and more of a quota to fulfill in a lot of ways. This was only made ever more apparent in the Switch era of Pokémon gaming, when even more avid fans of the series started to take issue with Game Freak and the Pokémon company's decision-making. Although Sun and Moon were the first games in the series to not include a national dex, it was Sword and Shield that invoked the ire of many fans of the franchise. The national dex was still gone, and DLC was added to the game that included a lot of the old Pokémon that Game Freak insisted couldn't be implemented before. And let me tell you, by utilizing this unbridled rage, the gamers really gave it to the Pokémon company. By buying it so much that it became the second best-selling Pokémon version behind Red and Blue. And I have to imagine that this was the moment where the Pokémon company realized that they could simply get away with anything. The game series had never seen this much concentrated outrage, and yet it sold like hotcakes. The company went on to hire on ILCA to develop and release a remade Pokémon Diamond and Pearl two years later. The games received the worst overall reception from gamers and media outlets across the board when compared to the previous three generations of remakes and also sold the best out of all of them. I do realize that this is going to be partially due to the popularity of the Nintendo Switch when compared to the GBA and the 3DS, but the DS is still way ahead of the Switch in sales, and Heart Gold and Soul Silver didn't beat out Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Regardless, two months later, Game Freak came back into the picture to show the class what they'd been cooking up in the background. After 26 years, Pokémon Legends Arceus iterated on the Pokémon formula in a way that hadn't been seen before. The game was lauded as an amazing new take on the franchise, one that was ripe with bountiful exploration, engaging mechanics, and addictive new features. And in the background of all of these compliments was a single, constant pit of negativity. Many of the graphics were sloppy and underbaked. Environments tended to be empty and devoid of activity. Performance suffered and stuttered as it tried its best on the Switch. Oh, and side note, I pronounced the Pokémon as Arceus, uh, mostly because of this. Arceus. If you pronounce it Arceus, though, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a Pokémon. But none of the negativity seemed to matter in the end. The new open-world concept had proven its worth, with Legends Arceus becoming the fastest-selling Pokémon Switch game to date. And instead of taking their time and getting everything done right, the Pokémon company struck while the iron was hot, and pushed Game Freak back into their offices to copy and paste what they could into another game. Less than 10 months later, Pokémon Scarlet and Violet were released into the world in possibly one of the most embarrassing displays that we've seen from the franchise. Graphical glitches and poor performance plagued the games. Environments and textures were of a wildly inadequate quality the game received the lowest rating of any of the core series in history. To emphasize how horrible the games were to play, Pokémon Scarlet and Violet went on to have the best launch of any console-exclusive game in the history of video games. And this is where we're at as video game consumers. Early access and unfinished releases seem to have stilted people's perspectives so much that people now accept and even defend releases like these. Because apparently we should just expect broken games on release and wait for patches later. At least, that seems to be the sentiment on many people's minds. But lengthy introduction aside, I personally passed on both Brilliant Diamond and Legends Arceus just because I wanted to wait and see what Generation 9 brought to the table in terms of innovation and updated gameplay. I wanted to see what Scarlet and Violet would do with these new ideas that Legends cooked up. And everything I've seen out of these games has not made them look good. I've hardly ever commented much on graphics in my previous videos just because I'm not a huge graphics-first guy, but everything that I've seen has looked rough. And despite all of the deserved negativity, there's been a constant humming in the background, one that flip-flops what people were talking about during the Legends Arceus release. While the negative stuff is in the foreground this time, many have been chanting in the background about how good Scarlet and Violet are how they had a lot of fun with them, and how they felt genuinely good about the series for the first time in a long time. And I couldn't ignore that. So in this video, I'll be playing through the entirety of Pokémon Violet. 
For those who haven't played it and care about spoilers, I'm going to be making no efforts to censor any information, plot points, or gameplay mechanics. I'll be covering everything that I feel is necessary to cover and pointing out what I think was done well and what could have been done better. Before I begin, I'll note that I have some limited time merch over at my merch shop. They're, um, they're just kind of portraits of random, like, monsters. They could be anything. Uh, just take a look, maybe they resonate with you. And also I'll note that my wife and I started a cooking channel for those who enjoy uh, cooking or just watching others cook. That'll be listed in the description if you care to check it out. All right, let's begin. So to start on a positive note, Violet starts with the most options for character creation that I've seen out of a mainline game, which is a long overdue micro improvement that this franchise needed. You can customize a lot of stuff about your character, all of which helps you to stand out in a way that we haven't seen in these games. If this was a thing in Legends Arceus, then it's cool that they moved it over to the main games as well. All right, good compliments all around. What's next? Well, we get a cutscene introducing the region of Paldea and its university known as Uva Academy. I know this is gonna seem like a petty complaint, but it's so weird to me to be playing a $60 full release game like this that doesn't have voice acting in 2022. It's really odd that such a simple improvement hasn't been made yet. But I guess that'll be the next big thing that they suddenly add that should have come around the time of Sword and Shield. Regardless, our cutscene continues to showcase the legendary Pokémon of the game flying around and dive-bombing into some water. There's a bit of artifacting and pixelation which isn't very fun to look at, but I kinda knew what I was getting into here. What I didn't know that I was getting was these parrots with Zoomer haircuts. The story starts off uh, the same general way that all of these games start. You're at home fatherless and your mom forces you to get dressed and the Pokemon professor comes by to tell you how you get a Pokemon that's super powerful compared to most of the other students at the academy. Well, I guess this time it's the academy director in this game. And you get to walk with the Pokemon beforehand. But regardless, it's the same spirit of intro. There's only one correct choice here, and it's the Dig Dug enemy. Not only is it objectively the cutest, it also doesn't evolve to be bipedal for some reason. That said, I do really like the final typing of these starters, which come in as Grass Dark, Water Fighting, and Fire Ghost, all of which are some of the rarer typing combos. What's even more impressive is that the final form of each starter gains a typing that's either effective against or resistant against the starter that they're weak to. So the Grass Pokémon gains Dark, which is good against the Fire Pokémon's Ghost, which is actually really fun and a very good move overall. From here, we're back to the basics, as your overzealous and fiery rival chooses the Pokémon that yours is strong against, leaving Donald Duck behind. Ironically, the whole ready-to-battle attitude suits Naimona even less than the previous know-it-all rivals like Barry because she's supposedly a champion-level trainer. Obviously, though, she's gonna send out a grass Pokémon against your fire and get surprised at your crazy knowledge. Yeah, it's kinda hard to get worked up about details like this knowing how they've typically gone in the past. I'll run through some mechanics in a moment, but for now we learn your typical catching stuff before the legendary Pokémon makes itself known. By feeding it a whole sandwich, the Pokémon gets revived, opposite to what would happen if I fed my dog Subway. Don't comment on its shape, don't comment on its shape, don't comment on its shape. Oh come on, that has to be intentional. So after the thing guides you through a cave and saves you from a level 40 Houndoom, you meet an NPC who feels like they're the main character who goes by Arvin. Arvin knows what this shiny legendary Pokémon is and throws a temper tantrum about it not mattering who his father is and all that. Of course, the Pokémon that he throws out to have you prove yourself against him is a level 5 Squabbit, because of course it is. I mean, even if I literally ignored all optional battles, my starter Pokémon would be level 6, and I'd have a backup pig. I don't think it's possible to lose this battle unless you continuously tail whip. And I get that the argument is always going to be, well, the game's for kids, dude. Like, the franchise isn't 26 years old. But wouldn't it be simpler to just have a difficulty setting that you can choose at the start of this game? I don't know, it just feels stupid when this guy talks himself up and tosses out one squirrel to show how worked up he is. So you head up to the top of the lighthouse to look at the distant clay blob that is your university. Which is just so funny to me. Like, the game was definitely built to be beautiful with this kind of sightseeing. But the graphics just show off these muddy and ugly buildings and trees and it's just like, holy shit, guys. At least Breath of the Wild had that cell shading to pull it through. This is just embarrassing. 
Either way, from here the game opens up a little bit so that you can at least explore around before heading to town. And this is where Pokemon Violet really takes a hard turn for the better in a very surprising way for me. When the game isn't lagging, exploration is really damn rewarding and feels like a steady dose of catching, auto-battling, and looking for items. Fortunately, when there are areas with a sparse amount of trees, some scattered ruins, and a couple of ponds, lag doesn't happen too often, which is when this game is at its best. Mechanically speaking, Violet does a lot more to separate it from the other mainline games. You can engage Pokémon from a distance by hitting them with a ball as hard as your 12-year-old or whatever body can muster. Being able to box and move your Pokémon party comes in immediately instead of partway through the game like Sword and Shield. Technical records and machines have been condensed back down into one-time-use TMs, which I do think adds a bit more complexity regarding on when you use them. Though that said, you can collect crafting materials to create more at a Pokémon Center, which I actually enjoy as a feature. Everything feels a lot more seamless and less about flashing in and out of menus, including the auto-heal feature, which makes healing up your Pokémon quick and easy, and the auto-battle feature, which is actually even more surprising to me. Basically, if you're running around an area where there are a lot of trash mobs, you can just have your Pokémon come out and start sucking up XP by auto-bashing every mob that it comes near. You don't have to use the feature if you don't want it, but for me it saves me the headache of trying to fight for levels and lets me just keep moving. I thoroughly enjoyed running through fields and listening to the sounds of my Pokémon beating the shit out of any random dopey creatures before collecting their fur, hair, tears, and whatever other bits of fluff that their bodies happen to drop. It's actually kind of morbid in that way. The only downside to this is that your Pokémon might attack something that you don't want it to, but as long as you know that, you can plan around it. Also, you can't really evolve Pokémon this way either. I think one of the biggest additions, though, is the fact that you can straight up just have a Pokémon forget or remember a previous move from the menus without needing to shuffle over to a move tutor. It really helps to cement the game as more about convenience above all else. Food is something that's been experimented with in various ways since Sapphire, I believe. And it makes another appearance here with more than just a way to affect your Pokémon. Basically, there are all kinds of street vendors which you can drop by and grab a snack from. But instead of feeding it to your Pokémon, your trainer eats it to gain a variety of interesting perks. Stuff like experience gains, chances to find more eggs, larger small Pokémon, more shinies, and so on. You can also have a picnic and create your own sandwiches, which mirrors the camp feature from Sword and Shield. I have to imagine an eighth of the development time was spent creating this discount cooking mama here, but whatever. I mean, most of the time when you make a sandwich, stuff just starts clipping through the bread. Things are clipping through the table. Sometimes you drop the top of the bread and it just goes through the entire table and you wind up with this topless sandwich. It's not an amazing feature. I mean, the idea is there, but man, this, uh, this did not turn out as well as they were hoping. You can also wash your Pokémon for happiness points, which is always weird with some of the more human-formed ones. There are a lot of really good features here which are simple additions, but they add up to make the game feel like you can jump in and out of the action with no issue. The entire experience is a lot of fun for me, and as much as I've set this whole thing up to be more about the negatives, I can't understate what Scarlet and Violet do well. If most of these mechanics hadn't been implemented the way that they have, I think I'd be more than a little upset with all of these shittier issues. And now for the bad when it comes to exploring and general issues. Although I guess the sandwich thing could have been put in this section, but I don't know. I like the idea at least, but either way. As you might have expected, the game's performance is terrible. Loading an area causes tremendous amounts of lag. Trainers, Pokémon, and objects pop in horribly. Any moving entity that's too far in the background renders as a solid 5 FPS PowerPoint presentation. Sometimes this happens in cutscenes where someone is actively being focused on too. Hideous, jagged lines plague every sort of round object because forcing any more geometry into them would cause even more lag. Textures look like they're made of Play-Doh nearly 90% of the time. Even cutscenes stutter here and there. My game crashed multiple times, which is the first time I've ever seen that happen on a console game. It really, really pulls you away from the experience, and I imagine that many of these critiques will eventually be patched out but I still have to mention them for those on the fence about the game at this moment in time. It's just very hard to justify a AAA game that releases with these issues, when indie games are releasing in much better states all the time. I honestly think that there are GameCube and Wii games that look better than Violet does, which is only even remotely saved by its decent lighting. 
and even that screws up all the time with different shadows flickering in and out of existence suddenly. After finishing up your initial explorations, the game throws its next slew of content at you in the form of the biggest city in the region, Mesa Goza. An overhead view of the place shows off all six of the city's citizens moving from area to area, really giving it that bustling sensation. Yeah, Mesa Goza may be the saddest main hub city out of every Pokemon game, which is extraordinarily unfortunate because the potential is there for it to be something brilliant. The obvious lack of people is something to be expected, but the more that you explore it, the lazier it seems to be. There are tons and tons and tons of restaurants here. Cafes, sandwich shops, grills, and so on. Every single one of these has you entering the restaurant and walking straight into a shop menu with no interior. All of them besides the sandwich shop. Now that may not sound that bad, but then you take into account the fact that these shops are copy-pasted at random. There are entire rows of stores where there are two or three back-to-back -back restaurants that sell the exact same menu items. It feels like Game Freak was playing a little too much Animal Crossing and decided to just copy and paste to make things look better without adding more substance. And by the time you get done entering and exiting the city's 70% restaurants, you pretty much just want to move on. There are some clothing and accessory shops at least, but it again feels like the devs wanted to give the impression that the city was this gigantic place that was filled with stuff to do by separating every article of clothing and every accessory into its own shop. The reality is that nearly every shop could have been condensed down into one or two, and it would have been that much more convenient. The city was going to feel barren no matter what. You might as well just make it convenient to some degree. It's just uh, such a sad city. It's described as a trading hub, and I have fonder memories of nearly every Pokemon Sword hub, which is a miserable thing to realize. I honestly can't understate how dissatisfied I am with this husk of a city. The lack of humans despite this place being huge and the amount of copy-pasted cafes is just amateurish. Third biggest video game franchise in the world, and this is what we got. And a lot of the haphazard shop placement applies to pretty much any big city in this game. There aren't any shops where you can go in and physically see behind their cell menu, at least besides the sandwich shops, which is so strange to see. There aren't houses that you can enter or even many buildings that you can enter. There are very rarely interiors, even despite every major city having the same giant gym tower in it with only one lobby floor to explore. It's a really odd turn for Pokemon. Before you make it into Mesa Goza though, you get another battle with your rival that introduces the game's battle gimmick. This time the concept of terrestrializing is brought to the table, which feels a lot like a different form of mega evolution from X and Y. Though in this case, every Pokemon can be terrestrialized and their typing can change through this process as well. Most of the time, they stick to one of their two potential types, but the concept is actually cooler than I expected. You gain your own Terra Orb to try it out against the game's villain group, Team Star. Unsurprisingly, the introduction to this team is pretty lame, as has been tradition throughout this franchise. This time, they're a group of misfit students who slack off and try to forcibly recruit others into their idea of stardom, or whatever. Let's get to class. Well, I figured out why there weren't more people in town. Holy fucking hell. Wow. Hey man, this is just what you have to expect from a new game, even if the franchise is as big as it is. Did you make a new generation of Pokemon? Well, good, that's all we care about. Ship it! Anyways, uh, school has you teleporting to various rooms of the building and talking to one important person in there. In this case, Arvin, Naimona, and someone who calls themselves Cassiopeia. Arvin wants you to take on five giant Pokemon in the region for some legendary herbs. Naimona wants you to take on eight gyms to become a champion level trainer like her. And Cassiopeia wants you to take out Team Star. It's about as straightforward as you can get, and I won't get into all of the semantics here just because there's nothing of substance yet. You also meet the Chad-looking Professor Turo, who gives you a brief bit of background about him studying the dangerous part of Paldea known as Area Zero, which your legendary Pokemon is from. He also tells you that you can ride your legendary Miraidon around like a bike. Yay! Alright, now the game actually opens up and allows you to tackle anything that you feel like doing in any order. Which I do enjoy as a concept, I just think that this entire last stretch of game sucked all of the oxygen out of the room for me. Now there is more to the Academy than being a brief road bump to push the plot along, but the execution is about as well done as Mesa Goza. Basically, you can attend classes. 
As you play the game more, you'll unlock more subjects. Each area of study has you attending the class, getting some info, and then answering a question before taking a test with the prize of experience candies for passing. And then you get to do all of that again because the first time was just the midterms. Now this actually wouldn't be that bad if it weren't for the fact that you have to load into and out of each class over and over. I probably spent a total of maybe two hours taking classes, and I would say 40% of the time was just loading. I'm not kidding about that. With every class having eight scenes to jump into and out of, and there being seven classes, that's a lot of load time. The actual content of these classes do teach you about the game's general mechanics and some new things that were introduced in this version, so they're sometimes worth it for the information. But it's also a crapshoot, I mean one of them just assaults you with words in other real world languages. Which I guess is good for kids, but yeah, not the game's brightest moment for sure. Field exploration from this point on opens up into nearly everything else that you'll be facing from here on out, and as always is pretty damn enjoyable for as much as we just went through. This means that you can start having your picnics, encounter wild Pokemon that are naturally terrestrialized, seamlessly fly to various landmarks that you've already been to, and participate in Terra Raid battles. That last one is Violet's take on Swords Raid Battles, and have you fighting a particularly strong terraformed Pokemon with a group of online people or offline bots. It again isn't really a challenge on the lower difficulties, but as things ramp up, you pretty much need other real humans to actually take on these Pokemon. I mean, six star stuff is just impossible without a full team of people who have optimized Pokemon. I guess I've just never been the biggest fan of these battles, but I don't particularly mind them as a concept. I just think they need some tweaking for people who don't have internet or just don't want to connect with other online people. I don't know. At the very least, they are something else to do and they are totally optional, which is fine. Being able to fly without having to acquire it was probably a necessity, but still makes the game more about convenience above all else when combined with all of the other features that keep you adventuring with minimal hassle. But the best part is that you can really take on anything in any order, and the game doesn't pull any punches when it comes to the regions that you're in. Pokemon don't scale with you, they just have regions where they're level 20 here and they're level 50 over here. And this actually solves the issue of difficulty being a joke that I was just complaining about before, because I can just adjust accordingly to what I want to deal with, at least until I get to a higher level and then have to go back and do all of the stuff that I bypassed before. As you continue to advance your Pokedex, you gain rewards every 10 levels through a little achievement track that encourages you to continue filling it. You can also swap out your Pokemon's Terraform typing if you gather enough of the right shards. It's an absolute bounty of being able to play your way and do things that you feel like doing when you want to do them. So let's break this whole thing down into parts. For those wanting to avoid heavy lore spoilers and the like, you may want to stop here or skip to the summary. Paldea's gyms take on what Sword and Shield did and put their own little spin on the formula. Each gym has its own mini-test that you have to perform before taking on the leader, which range from downright goofy to pretty interesting. On the goofier end, we have the Bug Gym's Olive Roll. I'm almost certain that this game wanted you to ferry this big-ass olive up and down its track, but I just kinda shot it over the fences like a volleyball. Then there's the gym where I wind up participating in an auction for some rare seaweed. The actual objective here is a bit uninspired when put up against the magnificence of the coveted olive roll, but I actually did like that the game guided me to this auction area where you can bid for various items that catch your eye. By the time the third gym rolled around, I was sorely overleveled just due to, uh, catching everything that I didn't have. My dex was well over 100 and my starter was in its mid-40s. But you know what, that's fine, because for the normal gym, Game Freak brought out the best gym leader out of every Pokemon game so far. With it being the normal gym, the test was to fight trainers like usual with the caveat of learning a clue from them. The clues help you to figure out what to order at a restaurant, which summons the boy himself, Larry. Look at that charisma, the mannerisms of an overworked wage slave. This guy has it going on in a way that I can't help but applaud Game Freak for. You can only go down from here. Appropriately, the fourth gym I took on was the ice one, which has you sledding down a hill. This one felt really silly because you don't gain momentum and wind up breaking randomly, which makes the whole icy slide feel like a clunky mess. It ain't no olive roll, that's for sure. 
The Ghost Gym is right down the road from the Ice Gym and has you taking on some double battles courtesy of Moist Critical and a couple of other people who are underdressed for these icy cold conditions. Eh, just, I don't know, it feels like they could have done a lot more for the Ghost Gym of all gyms. Maybe a little haunted house maze or a hide and seek with ghost Pokemon or the like. But it's even more of a missed opportunity when the main event comes out who's a rapper. Basically your test here is to warm up the crowd for her concert. And after you warm them up, the music gets going at a fever pitch. Which I expected to lead right into the main event at its peak. But instead you back out, report to the front desk, get asked one of the game's questions where the answer doesn't matter, and it rolls right back into the usual gym music. I guess it was too much to ask for the gym music to be different, but it's not like they didn't already do it with Sword's Dark Gym. Speaking of hide and seek, the electric gym is just that. Well, it's more of a Where's Waldo. The gimmick here is... dealing with a streamer. Jesus Christ, end me. I mean, it's realistic to a degree, I'd say, but god damn it, I'm part of the problem here. Speaking of hide and seek, the grass gym is, uh, hide and seek, but with flower Pokemon. Okay, look, I think if you have the electric streamer girl do the concert and the ghost girl do the hide and seek, then the grass guy can be the Where's Waldo, I guess. But it seems like these guys really wanted to subvert expectations as they have been all game, so they just keep throwing 20 curveballs in a row. Although, then again, maybe I'm just reading too much into it, but I don't know, it's just one of those things where you have all of these expectations of what and who you'll see getting shattered. So much so that it now seems less innovative and more formulaic. And I do think that the overall changes to a lot of these NPCs are nice to see. You get these really old students, a really young child Elite Four member for some reason, chubbier women instead of just big hiker men, built men and women alike, the ice gym leader looking a lot more feminine, just as a couple of the women look more masculine. It's cool to witness, but when it keeps happening with everything, it feels like Game Freak was told to just shuffle everything around. And I'm not saying that people like these don't exist in the real world, but I can't recall Pokemon having this many sweeping changes to people's roles all at once like this. On one hand, it is a good step towards accepting everyone and seeing them represented in a game like this. On the other, it feels almost more corporate with how sudden it is. Either way, the final gym has you playing a bit of Simon Says with a Metacham, which is alright, it's easy, and it's weird, but I think it's a fine new idea for the gym tests even if it doesn't come close to the almighty Olive Roll. Oh, and also, just to make me look like a total asshole, the gym leader here is the epitome of a feminine woman who has her own makeup line and is a fashion icon because apparently Game Freak knew I'd launch into a tangent about how frequently they tried to subvert expectations. Overall, the gym run was fine in this game. There were a couple of interesting mix-ups of the usual formula and some which really fell flat. It's just pretty average overall, and I actually think that I enjoyed Sword and Shield's take on gyms more, especially the music. Sword and Shield had some killer tracks overall, actually. I'd say it's probably some of my favorite music in any of the games. But I think my biggest issue with the gym run is how little it adapts to the way that you approach them. I've been told repeatedly over the years, whether through anime canon or just through various parts of games, that Pokemon gym leaders basically adjust their threat level by assessing how strong their challenger is. That if the quote-unquote earliest gym leader notices someone roll in with level 50 Pokemon, they'll grab their bigger lineup to do battle with. And this concept has never been more important than in a game where the player can beeline it towards nearly any gym, or at least the first half of them right out the gate with no HM upgrades. But every early gym leader is hard stuck in bronze just as all of the late gym leaders are diamond level fighters. Which is crazy because Nemona will actually challenge you with a lineup that mirrors the amount of badges that you have. So I'd have these crazy yin and yang moments where Nemona takes me on with level 40 to 50s, knocks out one of my Pokemon, and then the gym leader sends out two leaves and a pile of wood like that's where I'm at here. How much cooler would it have been for each leader to have a potential of five to eight lineups, where they're actively switching out for stronger and stronger Pokemon, depending on where you're at on your badge acquisition journey? I don't know, it just seems like a majorly wasted opportunity to me. Either way, the leaders themselves tend to stick to their types, but will throw you a curveball in the form of their Terra Pokemon, which have been transformed into their gym's typing. I do like this because while their weaknesses remain, their offensive capabilities tend to be completely random from what you'd expect since the original Pokemon retains what they had without learning new moves to suit its Terra form. 
It's kind of cool and the music expands on the Sword and Shield's chanting hymn, but I still think that Sword and Shield has the much better gym track. Throughout your journey, Naimona tends to pop up at every gym in some way or another, though she only challenges you sometimes, thankfully. That's definitely a nice change because I was way overleveled for a lot of this journey, just because of the experience gained from traveling around and catching everything. You'll meet the Elite Four members here and there, so there is some familiarity with them before encountering them down the line. But that's really it in terms of the gym run. The Paldean League system is definitely a bit different from what we've seen thus far, and still has the game's characters treating you much more like a student than a random trainer. As such, you report in with your gym badges and are told to take an interview. Here we're interviewed by one of the League members, who's sitting at a desk that's far too tall for her for some reason. This interview is, uh, okay, for lore reasons, I guess it's alright. Uh, they're basically testing to see if you would make a champion who's of a high enough caliber in both character and knowledge. Anyways, I failed it four times. A lot of the questions are gimmies, which range from, do you like Pokemon, to, what was your starter type? But then they're like, uh, what gym gave you the hardest time, and what was the leader's name, and what type of Pokemon did they use? I don't remember these fucking losers' names, I had zero issues with any of them. Besides the immaculate man that is Larry, but I wouldn't dare speak his name. Also, I didn't remember the name of the town that he was in, but that's besides the point. Okay, so I'm just gonna say this now, and you can choose not to believe me, but pretty much all of my scripts are written as I play. So I play a bit, I pause, and then I write. And occasionally I'll go back and amend something as new info comes up. I swear to God, I did not know about Larry. I just thought his name was so normal compared to everyone else, and uh, now this game's making me look like I'm running back and writing these jokes after learning new things. But yeah, my main man Larry is an Elite Four member. Jesus Christ, I could not have come up with a better candidate. But yeah, this is probably the worst Pokemon League ever in terms of flashiness, and I know that sounds dramatic, but I mean, something's gotta be the worst, right? You know how literally every game since the first one has had themed rooms for each Elite Four member besides Sword and Shield? The last one worked because you'd go to the main stadium of the game, in front of a crowd of people, and it was very immersive in that way. This one just has you staying in one room, and the League members coming to you. It's fucking weird, and it's really lazy. Though the upside here is that the ones that you defeat head to the sidelines after, so I guess that's cool enough. But yeah, this league sucks. It's really sad to see the lack of cool transforming rooms that most of these games have had until now. The league members tend to follow their same old, I have these types, shtick, which actually even extends to their Terra typings. Like, that's the one time that you can have them mix something up, and you still have them changing their typing to match their lineup. I don't know, I'm just not a fan. Regardless, we have Ground, then Steel, then Larry, then Dragon. All of these are weak to Ice, especially Larry. Well, besides the Steel Child. But yeah, the leader falls and then you become the champion of the league. The music is probably the worst champion music in the series, at least to me. But that kind of falls in line with the music in general in this game. It's not bad music. It's not like I disliked listening to it. It just felt like I was listening to the same stuff kind of over and over again and it was just okay, it was very mid, but whatever. When you're done, you battle Naimona one last time, who continues to somehow be on par with the likes of Hop and Howe with her one-note personality. Actually, with the different character arts that Hop and Howe have when they go through defeats and become downtrodden and eventually overcome that, I'd put them above Naimona. She just likes the battle, and that's cranked to 11 in this game, so I don't really consider her to be a very interesting character by even the slightest margin. I'd probably put her right on par with Barry from Diamond and Pearl. As far as Arvin's quest for legendary herbs goes, well... Okay, so they're called Herba Mystica, HM. When you collect one, your Maridon learns how to do stuff like surf or climb, which are historically HMs. I'm not sure whether I hate it or I'm impressed, but I guess I think it's funny overall. It's not like they're all former HMs, but the initial thought of being able to navigate areas that were previously inaccessible is there. The complete moveset involves being able to cross water with surf, glide through the air, climb up vertical surfaces, jump higher, and dash to move faster. The challenges to get these herbs involve taking on Titan Pokémon, and dealing with whatever challenge they throw at you before you can take them on. So it's kind of like five more gyms, complete with their own badges. The first one I took on was a big old bird which rolls really slow boulders at you due to lag. 
The second one was this futuristic Iron Dawn fan, which I was woefully underleveled for. I managed to pull through it with battle items, but I didn't realize just how low level I was until Arvin joined me later with a level 44. My third bout was with this big ass catfish monster. There's a cool bit of interaction between the catfish and these little sushi boys who basically command them, which leads to a back-to-back -back fight with the two. After this, I swing back to the last two around areas that I probably should have been to already, seeing as I can gain the dash and high jump abilities, which seem a lot less useful now. It's worth noting at this stage that the original idea of having some obstacle to overcome is pretty much out the window, as that only seemed to be a one-time deal with the bird Pokemon. Instead, I'm just basically chasing these titans around, which isn't particularly engaging. As such, the last one that I took on was this giant enemy crab, which just kind of crawled around a mountain. The entire reason for Arvin's quest, uh, well, it probably leads to the most touching bit of story that I've ever personally seen out of these games. I know that Pokemon's tried to get heavy, particularly around the Gen 5 to Gen 6 games, but usually that heaviness stems from some really over-the-top storyline that really tries to aggressively make everything into the end of the world. Just these very exaggerated anime storylines, I guess, which, I mean, it makes sense given the nature of Pokemon. But it just doesn't do it for me without a lot more depth and relatability. But Arvin is gathering these herbs because of their magical healing properties. And the reason for this is because his big dog Pokemon was injured horribly and never recovered. It's one of the easiest ways to take these animal creatures and make them relatable to anyone who's ever owned a pet that they've loved. It's not some out there story about the future of everyone hanging in the balance. It's just a boy and his dog who he loves and would do anything for. And that really killed me when I found out the full story. I have to give Game Freak massive points for finally bringing some genuine human emotion to these stories of theirs without it being something overly dramatic and I can't help but enjoy every step of watching this guy's dog get stronger with every bit of progress. When you finally gathered all of the herbs and Arvin's dog is recovered, his dad calls in again to explain something that you already knew about the upgrade that you just got for Maridon. He then reveals that he's a gigantic deadbeat as nearly every father of a main character seems to be in these games. To be fair in Scarlet, it's the mom, but in this case it works for me. He goes, holy shit son, it's been years. I locked myself out of the lab and only you can get into it. When you get over to the lab, Turo's like, hey kiddos, I'm down in area zero still. Come on down. I do like that they continue to portray the guy as a piece of shit instead of doing the whole I've been trapped down here, son, I'm so sorry, routine. But yeah, this is it for Arvin until you complete the Pokemon League and get done with the Team Star stuff. It's a good set of progression objectives that give you the capabilities to continue to power through the rest of the map. And I really like the story attached for a Pokemon game. Finally, we have the Team Star Escapades. So I'll come out and say it right now. I actually enjoy the structuring around the villainous team of this game. Basically, they're just students on the brink of expulsion, who hate all of the rules of the academy that they go to and are acting out. Their end goal isn't to rule the world or anything drastic like that. They're just kind of doing their thing. Which reminds me of a lot of the reasons that I like Team Skull in Sun and Moon, though those guys did reach a bit further. Basically, your goal is to run through five bases and take out the leaders of each. And normally this is where Pokemon does that thing where you fight like 50 grunts in a row and they all have evil looking Pokemon. The problem is that there's usually only so many of those. So you'll fight grunt after grunt with the same Arbox, Raticates, Houndooms, Might Yenas, and so on. Well, the foremost goal of convenience makes itself apparent again, as these bases have you auto-battling these grunts with three of your Pokemon before taking on the boss. I can't stress how much more fun and interesting this is over running through a base filled with teleports and movement pads while manually fighting every grunt that gets in the way. Even in red and blue, I would do my best to avoid all of the optional fights just because of the tedium involved. This gets that out of the way while still making Team Star seem like they're reacting to an invader instead of idly standing by and just watching for me. Now, all of that said, the whole process becomes stale almost immediately, unfortunately. 
It's a great idea on the surface, but every single starbase looks like this. Fight the grunts in auto battles, knock out 30 of their Pokemon, and then the boss comes out on a modified Reva room and takes you on before trying to run you over with the dipshit car monster. I expected the finale to at least look different from base to base. And it's really too bad that these guys were likely pressed for time and decided to control C, control V. Plus it becomes immediately obvious that the Switch or this game in general just can't handle this many entities on screen at the same time. Sound effects will outpace the animations happening on screen, and the whole experience feels like you're wading through quicksand. It's again a fantastic overall idea, but they needed something to vary between each base. And they probably shouldn't have had a big open field of grunt battles if the performance couldn't keep up. There's obviously a bit of story attached to all of this, as your director shows up with his hair dyed and styled to try to pretend like he's a student who wants to help take down Team Star. Cassiopeia is almost 100% the person who started Team Star and now regrets it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Basically, every time you take out a boss, they concede to you, give you their team badge, and a bit of backstory plays out. The first guy that I took on was the former student president, and other students hated him when he tried to enforce too many rules. The second one uh, was just a rich kid who invented the Starmobile monstrosities. Not the Pokemon, just the dumb stuff attached to it. Fortunately, there's an upside in the story department when the rich kid's tutor and former academy director pops into the picture to share a bit more of the story. These kids in Team Star were basically bullied at school until they decided to fight back. And this was the biggest reason for creating the team. After their formation, they exacted vengeance on their bullies in some way or another, before continuing on with what they've been doing up until now. That's not a bad motivation at all. Definitely better than just kids acting out. The third boss is a kid who enjoys creating fashion outfits and talks in old English for whatever reason. I do actually have to say that Game Freak, or at least the translation team, have gotten really good at creating semi-interesting dialogue for kids. I'm not saying that everyone is giving these very compelling speeches that stick with me, but more that I could see certain kids saying some of the stuff that these ones do. It's not always the case, but the star bosses in particular seem like they could be real kids. Besides when they give a little tearful speech about their treasure or whatever. Anyways, the last two bosses are Angie and Fisty. The Angie one is just mad about everything and doesn't have much to add beyond pointing out that Team Star never actually got into a big fight with their former bullies. They just confronted them and tried to fight them, but the bullies all ran away and dropped out soon after, which made Team Star look like the villains. The overall story here tends to point towards the real-world idea that oftentimes teachers and other faculty tend to not notice or care about bullying happening around them, which might lead to non-stop torment or conflict in schools. It is a good lesson, and it's possible that a little personal experience is shining through from the writers here. Fisty, on the other hand, is out front, defending her base personally. She gets convinced to go rest so that the encounter is the same as always. But the grunt that told her to go rest was a former bully of hers who was then defended by Fisty when other kids started to bully the grunt. So yeah, it's been apparent for a while that these guys are actually good, which I'm completely cool with even if it is a bit ham-fisted after the very first flashback. Cassiopeia reveals themselves to be the leader behind this whole operation, which is shocking for everyone as you might expect. Also, the girl named Penny who's been giving us rewards after our missions doesn't show up this time, so it's her. Of course, the director decides to test you first, which was actually the hardest damn battle that I've had in the entire game, which actually made it pretty fun for me. But yeah, here comes Penny. Everyone is shocked. We fight, and then that's the end of it. Oh, but the music is probably the best in the game so far. The only real issue that I have with all of this is that this Penny girl was being bullied on the front steps of the school by Team Star members at the start of the game, which is probably partially the reason why she wanted to take them down. But you would think that if Team Star grunts were blown out by a new student, those grunts would go tell their boss that a girl with blue and red hair got defended by a new kid. And those guys would put two and two together and go, oh shit, our boss is back. This only works out if Penny changed her signature look, but uh... She did not, just judging from the fact that she wants the battle recorded to show the rest of Team Star. I don't know, whatever. Pokemon. It's still not a bad setup for a villain group, and I'd have to place them on the high end when compared to all of the other previous groups in these games, at least in terms of their motivations. The only thing that I can really fault them on is the fact that they didn't really seem to have a goal beyond recruitment. 
and that becomes really obvious after their motivation for formation is spelled out. And then nothing else really happens for the entire time. When all is said and done, it's a big happy ending as the director allows the kids to come back into the fold as assistant teachers and have them utilize the methods that they used against my guy in order to train other students. It's a fine ending, I suppose, and I don't really think it ever had a chance of going any other way, which is probably my biggest complaint. I don't want to host another episode of me grumbling about cliché stories in a Pokémon game, so I'll keep it brief. When you got all of your initial info, the outcome of all of this was pretty obvious, which would be fine if I didn't spend the whole time doing this stuff alongside the Gym and Titan objectives. When it drags on like this, the idea that anything different is going to happen dissipates quickly and leaves you wanting to mash through these scenes. But I guess that's all I really have to say. It's still a fine villainous group overall, even if they didn't turn out to be villains after all. So when you're done with all of your gym badging, titan stomping, and team star dismantling, you've got some stuff that you can still do, obviously. There's the distinct endgame goal of heading to the crater in the middle of the map and figuring out what Deadbeat in the center of it wants from us. But you can also bond with all of your teachers, which may have actually been a thing that you could do right after you were done taking all of your final exams in the school. Basically, if you talk with them a few times, they'll entrust you with a task that seems to be some kind of endgame side quest. I'm not super sold on a young kid getting real close with their teachers, only for them to ask him to bring them something super sweet, but, um... Yeah, it's fine. Regardless, our main missions involve bringing more Herba Mystica to the Home Ec teacher and freeing ancient Pokémon from shrines that they've been imprisoned in for the History teacher. The rest of the teachers have their own little contained tasks and trials that you help them with and you typically gain a reward from them afterwards. Oh, and the nurse tells you how she failed her exams repeatedly to become a health teacher and how she dislikes being a nurse because it's boring. Then she tells you how inspired she is by you and how she's going to try to become a teacher again. This is insanely inappropriate for faculty. Pokemon. Honestly, this wouldn't be as bad if Game Freak didn't have the unwavering goal of having you play as a child at any given moment. This whole setup was kind of like a university. They could have easily made our characters be 18, but I guess you gotta be a kid, I don't know. I don't know, somehow trying my P.E. teacher's meat sandwich doesn't really quite sit right with me as things stand. At least she gave me 10 bottles of her protein as a reward. I don't think that makes things any better, actually. So freeing the old Pokémon has you running around and pulling 8 stakes for each shrine, making a total of 32. The entire process took about an hour to pull all of the stakes and catch the Pokémon, which was a fun little side objective. Reporting back to the history teacher has her gushing about the possibilities of what each artifact was originally used for that these Pokémon were created from. And the reward for grabbing all of them and basically creating history is the TM called Nasty Plot. There's like three or so ways that I could go with when making a joke about this reward, but uh, I'm just gonna try not to read too much into it. The music for the ancient Pokémon is wild though. Probably some of my favorites so far, for sure. I'll keep you posted on Music Quest 2022. The second task of bringing herbs to the home ec teacher is actually something that I can't take on yet because I have to beat the game before I can engage in five and six star terror raid battles, which is where these herbs drop from. Regardless, my big issue with this is that for as accommodating as the game has been for most things, I'd really like it if it told me on the map how many stars a raid battle has before getting to it. It's frustrating because you would think that the higher level raid battles would be in the areas with high level Pokémon, but it's seemingly completely random. So I'll often hit up a raid battle only for it to be a 1 or 2 star, and it makes me not want to try to seek out the rarer high star battles. Okay, let's get into this crater. Accompanying me on this task is Arvin, Naimona, and Penny, who all quip at each other with their various... personalities. Turo greets you and only you before telling you to get into the fucking crater. At this stage, this thing's being set up like all of these lines from Turo are AI generated or something similar, just because of how he's talking to you and how he doesn't really respond to his son. I'm not a fan of the idea that this story will probably be game freakified. I'm just afraid that the writers would rather turn this into a touching father-son reunification with the idea that Turo's been trapped down here for a decade. And I really think that Turo's neglect of his child sets up Arvin's story with his dog Pokémon as his only support in his life to be a lot more touching and impactful. 
But what do I know? So we jump into the grater, Maridon does not want to be here, and Turobot tells us to unlock the four locks that are sealing the lab. Hey, at least they can laugh at their own designs too. That's cool, I guess. So Area Zero is easily the most visually impressive idea in the game, even if the textures and performance can't always keep up. It's not underwhelming in the slightest, at least not to me, and gives me heavy Made in Abyss vibes. The music is also easily my favorite out of everything that I've heard, thus concluding Music Quest 2022. I know it shouldn't be something that affects me as much as it does, but a good soundtrack will usually cause me to overlook a lot more flaws than I usually would. And this crater really does a lot to make me forget many of my criticisms this late into the game. You also can't ride Miraidon yet, which I actually think does more to make this place more daunting in a lot of ways. If I could just start climbing and gliding across it, I imagine I'd miss a lot more of what this area has to offer and not think of it the way that I did upon initially coming down here. Our trek down has our party getting to know each other, though a lot of it is just Naimona talking about strong Pokemon, Arvin making food-related puns, and Penny calling them both dumbasses. At one point, Arvin reveals that he never really knew his dad at all, and that email communication just stopped with him years ago. As we delve further down, we begin running into futuristic renditions of current Pokemon. First, we encounter a deli bird known as Iron Bundle, then the same type of Don fan that we ran into during our Titan quest called Iron Treads. Then we hit a Hydreigon, Hariyama, Gallade, Tyranitar, and Volcarona in the forms of Iron Jugulus, Hands, Valiant, Thorns, and Moth, respectively. I thought these things were kind of stupid at first, but I did warm up to the idea of them the more that I thought about their implications. I mean, let's think about it for a moment. I'm not a big competitive Pokemon guy, but I do know that the likes of Tyranitar, Hydreigon, and Volcarona to a degree have historically been good for competition. Then you've got some scarier looking fighters in the forms of Hariyama, Donphan, and Gallade. And all of these Pokemon are now definitely inorganic, which makes them man-made more than likely. This implies that humanity likely drove Pokemon to become extinct, and you've got two big routes from here with how you can think of what happened. Route 1 is that humanity missed Pokemon and decided to recreate them. If this were the case, you'd expect a lot more cute Pokemon to be part of the selection, and it's possible that the ones that came through just happened to be some of the stronger ones, though this does become less likely when there's tons of them roaming around Area 0. Route 2, however, becomes the more obvious choice for me when you consider Iron Bundle. Delibird has historically been more of a mascot and less of a fighter. And maybe I'm wrong about that, maybe Delibird is used in competitive for certain things, I don't really know. But either way, now it's more of a powerhouse compared to before. And this makes me think that with as powerful as these things are, that humanity drove their predecessors to extinction, recreated them as war machines, and used them for... well, who knows? Probably violence of some sort. But either way, the implication is really fun to think about, even if we might never get a true elaboration on it. So the four locks are deactivated in these abandoned research centers that feel very Chrono Trigger in nature, and serve as a place to rest or to teleport to the surface. Throughout our unlocking process, Turo pops in to explain a few things, and even directly addresses his son, which makes the AI theory less likely. What he does say is that the robotic Pokemon we've been battling are from the future, and that the time machine that he invented is what's bringing them through. Further in, it's revealed that Maridon is a futuristic form of the weird-ass bike Pokemon that this game cooked up. You know what that tells me? This thing ain't legendary. It's just a common-ass bike lizard, but from the future. Oh, by the way, Scarlet here varies by having its time machine going to the past and causing ancient Pokemon to pour through if you hadn't guessed. The third station has Arvin explaining that he didn't like Maridon for a long time basically due to him blaming it for his father's disappearance when people began to question where this weird-ass Pokemon came from. Meanwhile, I've been running through this entire game and hardly anybody has commented on the fact that I'm riding this really weird, futuristic-looking Pokemon. But yeah, I guess back then it was such a big deal that, um, his father disappeared. Maybe you stop to think a little bit here if you're Arvin and go, hmm, maybe Dad just wanted to go. Oh no, oh geez, oh, people can't see this Pokemon, I gotta go back to the crater, see ya son! Even Turo's journals seem to tell a bit of a different story. He seems to have wanted to come back down to the crater for a while, wound up having a son, and then used the fact that people on the surface were questioning where Maridon came from as an excuse to take it away and continue his experimentation. 
The final lock is where the exploration for Turo's behavior comes into play. Not only does Turo begin nonstop babbling like he's malfunctioning, a journal entry has him noting that Arvin's mom walked out on him and left him with Arvin, and that he wished that he had two of himself to continue his work at the rate that he wants to. I have to admit that this is probably the most intrigued that I've been by a Pokemon story ever. Like, just ever. Black and White had some decent bits, and Sun and Moon had a few moments, and Sword and Shield had like one or two glimpses at a decent story. But I really like everything that I've seen involving Paldea's crater and Turo as a flawed human being who left his kid behind to go work. At least, so far. When we finally get to the main lab, which is encased in these Terra crystals, another Maridon shows up and scares the shit out of our Maridon before heading into the lab. After this happens, future Pokémon bum rush us, turning this into a mini-boss battle of sorts. This whole stretch of game has been fantastic up to this point, and I had some pretty high hopes heading into the lab to get to the bottom of everything. The big reveal is something that this game pretty much spelled out, but is still pretty cool in its own right. Yeah, Turo is an AI-powered robot, or android, or whatever. But what I didn't expect was the fact that the real Turo is dead, and that he died when he got between our Maridon and the really aggressive one from earlier. There isn't a lot of human death in these games, and I'm actually glad that Game Freak went through with that here, because this all but confirms that Turo wasn't a good dad, and that he wasn't stuck in some future where he couldn't get back to his son. I know it seems weird to hang on to the idea that Turo has to be a bad father, but I really do think that realistic characters like these are quite sparse in Pokemon games. And it's good to see the idea that a flawed human is revered as this brilliant scientist, and that the true heroic figures in this game are the leaders of the academy that you go to. That adults aren't always these black or white portrayals of good or evil. That you can have strict teachers that want to see kids grow, just as you can have genius scientists who suck at parenting. This is probably the most impressed that I've been with Game Freak's writing possibly ever. And that's really shocking to me since I went into this whole thing with a pretty stilted attitude. As you head down towards this time machine, AI Turo explains that the machine was built to send Pokeballs into the future, catch the Pokemon there, and then bring them back into the present. Turo's dream was to have these future Pokemon live in harmony with present Pokemon, which is a really stupid dream. But whatever. The AI also explains that although he was created to be a perfect copy of Turo's thought process, that he doesn't see the logic in letting these future Pokémon run rampant when they're just going to destroy the ecosystems of current Pokémon. I mean, it doesn't take a fucking mastermind to figure that one out. This is why he wants you to destroy the Time Machine once and for all, which is something that he wasn't able to accomplish on his own. Because, you know, he's a bot. He can't go against this programming. The thing itself is in this big-ass chamber that's been surrounded by technology-enhancing Terra Crystals. The game has no idea what to do with these things rendering the way that they are, which is sad as always, but expected. Now here's the cool part. So another reason why AI Turo couldn't just shut the machine off was because he needed the Violet book that Arvin has had the entire game. The book has Turo's ID in it, which is something that's needed to approve the override process. But if I use this override, the system will take control of AI Turo's code and cause him to attack us. In a Pokémon battle, I assume. I don't know, he could just sucker punch my frail, childlike body. Or pull out a gun, or something along those lines, I guess. I know this sounds silly because why would the system fight back if it was built to have an override? But I think the game tiptoes around this idea, and I really hate doing this for devs, but I think I'll fill in some blanks just because it pretty much all but states exactly what's going on here. So I imagine override protocols were a requirement by whoever funded this whole operation, or that they were put in to make the other scientists feel safe, or whatever. But Turo was such a huge pile of shit that he put in defenses meant to stave off anyone from getting in the way of his research. This is pretty awesome, and I do love the way that the writers went with this. But yeah, the penultimate fight is against the six future Pokémon, with the final defense being the other Maridon. The dialogue from the AI uses some leet speak, which has been lame for a very long time, but I imagine that this was put in lieu of voice acting just to convey what the tone is here. The first fight is pretty fun, though, with the second one being one of those scripted battles that serve as a cutscene, almost. But to be fair, it's actually done pretty well. Your Maridon is much weaker than the other one, and gets taunted into attacking before the other one charges up a big attack. 
At this point, the taunt wears off and you can endure the Hyper Beam with Endure. Then you can heal up and terraform into the Dragon type before unloading onto the other Maraidon. It's pretty fun and cool to watch, actually, which, again, is another first for me with these scripted scenes. Okay, enough compliments. The end scene here has AI Turo telling everyone that he envied their adventures, and that although he was chained here, he was glad to have called on them and all that. Then he claims that the time machine won't shut down until he's either dead or gone. So I'm sitting here thinking, shit, he's gonna destroy the machine along with himself. But what he wants to do instead is use the machine to head into the future, which will also shut it off. Okay, no problem. But then he says it. Oh, Arvin, I'm a perfect copy of your dad's thoughts, and he loved you with all of his heart. Yep, you knew it was coming, I knew it was coming. They can't just let it stay the way that they had it, right? Arvin, of course, after spending the entire game resenting his deadbeat dad, goes, Ugh, oh, how could he leave like this? Oh, come the fuck on. I mean, I guess it could just be more of a bewilderment kind of thing, like, after all of this, how could this copy of my dad leave? But, uh, I don't know. You had it. You almost created the perfect Pokemon storyline. And then you blew it right at the end. Not that this ruins everything, it's just more that it puts a damper on the whole thing for me. I know that some people are gonna disagree with that, I guess it's just my own personal opinion. It just really bothers me for all of the reasons that I listed leading up to this. Anyways, that's it. The group rolls out into the sun after 30 seconds of Duke Nukem Forever on the Xbox 360 load time and then the credits roll. And the credits have some kind of, uh, like, real person singing along. It's like the only voice acting you'll hear in this game is this guy singing. I don't know if this is a real song or one that they came up with, but, um, it sucks. The credits also appropriately stutter as they scroll up. The aftermath of the game has you and the other three getting called into the director's office to receive your obligatory Master Ball. Then Arvin goes, You know, when you're building something as mind-blowing as a time machine, that takes priority over showering your son with attention. Yeah, you might as well immortalize the guy as a good man who was a hero instead of a crazy scientist who wanted to ruin the world with future Pokémon. Good God, what a ridiculous line of logic. Just own it, Game Freak. No one's gonna be mad if a Pokemon professor is the bad guy of the game for once. Well, okay, I'm sure there are some people out there that would be really mad about that, but I mean, I don't know. I think it's interesting. The post game is actually pretty cool in its own way, though I won't run through it like I did with the rest of this video. But basically, as a champion, you can choose to test the gym leader's full might meaning that you can re-challenge them at their very strongest, which is usually something reserved for the chairman to do. But why have the adult at the head of the company do it when you can have an unpaid child laborer do it? This has you flying to each gym and taking on a full team of mid-60s Pokémon, which wasn't super challenging, but still had a few roadblocks involved. I do wish that there were a bit more change-ups in the typing, but I also didn't expect that to happen. The whole thing took a little over an hour, after which you meet with the chairman to discuss your findings. Of course, she asks to go somewhere a little more private, and you take her to your room. Yeah, that's still weird. The cool bit is that she asks which gym leader was the weakest, which one was the strongest, which left the biggest impression on you, and which one you liked the most. My answers were the water gym for the weakest, since I didn't like that guy, the bug gym for the strongest, since that lady's foratress gave me issues, and Larry for the other two. That's my guy out there. Once you've done this, you can participate in a school-wide tournament that hosts battles between students and staff alike, which is this game's version of the Battle Tower. The battle music kind of sucks, so I probably won't do it more than once. But yeah, I wound up taking out Arvin, the biology and PE teachers, and the chairman again. And that's about it for the game beyond the five and six star Terra battles which pop up now and allow you to get the Herba Mystica. The main use for getting this is to increase the odds of shiny Pokemon, making it your post-game time sink if you choose so. But for me, I'm gonna call it here and attempt to sum up this roller coaster of a game. The reality is that this may be the best Pokemon game in terms of its open-ended structure, near-limitless convenience, intertwining storylines, and boundless sense of exploration. It really does do so many things right that it's really easy to forget a lot of the negatives that come with it. But those negatives are there, and they rear their ugly heads when you're really starting to get into the game. And I think that I need to start this with the negatives just because we've been positive for a little while now. 
The reality is that this game was not ready to be shoved out at the time that it was. Hell, maybe it was never ready for the Switch's ancient hardware. Nintendo has needed a Switch Pro or a Switch 2 that sells at a higher price for a very long time, even since the days of Breath of the Wild. And while I would love to pin this whole thing on Nintendo's archaic attitude towards the game industry, I really can't. The Pokemon Company had to have known. Game Freak had to have known. This game is writhing with horrible performance issues, muddy textures, poor optimization, and clunky animations. We're still in this age where Pokemon Move animations are on par with Pokemon Stadium for the Nintendo 64. Nothing is voice acted and Pokemon still flop around back and forth to convey many of their attacks as if the animator simply rotated them from left to right. Background objects sputter at a low frame rate. Random buildings, Pokemon, and NPCs pop in suddenly as you traverse the landscape. It's a veritable circus of downright embarrassing production that doesn't suit the third biggest gaming franchise in the slightest. The only reason that these guys could get away with this was likely due to the nature of Pokemon being a turn-based RPG rather than an action platformer or something similar. But even looking past those obvious issues, I do have some minor problems with the appearance of this region. I know that a lot of this is going to be hand-waved away by just saying that this is what Paldea is like, but I do think that a lot of the individualism of how buildings are structured is just gone from Scarlet and Violet. Don't get me wrong, there was definitely a variety of people that stood out as having a more individual flair. Even one of the teachers promotes the idea that students should be allowed to wear whatever they want at any given time as long as they at least wear one of the four uniforms of the school with it. But in addition to buildings themselves hardly ever having interiors, everything looks very much the same. I mean, to clarify, sure, you still have your stereotypical ghost town decoration or the water town or the electric city and so on, but that's just on the surface. All the shops look exactly the same no matter where you're at because they're copy-pasted. This goes for Pokemon centers and their workers also, as every single one of them wear their short-sleeved uniforms no matter where they are. The regional Pokemon centers that look completely different from area to area are gone, replaced instead with these corporate gas station looking centers. Gym buildings are all identical and have the exact same lobby look. Sandwich shops are obviously the same everywhere, with the same guy who teaches you new recipes hanging out in them. There just wasn't a lot of love put into buildings in this game, beyond their initial presentation when entering a town and even that initial presentation is bogged down by performance issues often. And I could continue to harp on these points until I'm blue in the face, but I think it's been said a thousand times by people everywhere. And the worst part about all of this is that I cannot in good faith blame anyone for looking at this mess and going, ah, no thanks. But the reality is that this game brings some of the freshest ideas to the mainline games that I've ever seen out of the entire series. This whole system of effectively 18 badges is actually really cool in a way, as every single typing is covered exactly by this amount. It's surprisingly clever, and it's the linchpin of what makes this game's exploration as good as it is. There's always something to do, somewhere to go, new Pokemon to catch, and new sights to see. And if you look past those muddy textures, then there are some awesome sights to behold and fun chunks of the map to explore. There are always little items catching your eye, Pokemon to catch or battle, glowing crystals to engage with. There really was no reason to believe that Game Freak would suddenly turn a lot of their systems on their head. Well, unless you played Legends Arceus. But the innovation and expansion on what they had turned Scarlet and Violet into made them so much more. Even with all of the horrible performance issues, this game tries its best to make up for them and progress this series into a new generation that reflects an open-world adventure game spliced together with a turn-based battle system. I found myself wanting to find new Pokémon, to jump into a chasm off the beaten path to see what could be found down there, to sidetrack and attempt to fill my Pokédex. I actually carried this feeling into completing my Pokédex for the third time ever with the previous times being in Pokemon Moon and before that Sapphire. It isn't a feeling that I've felt in a long while, and that should speak volumes for how interesting this game was to explore. Even the story has some of the most down-to-earth and realistic writing that I've seen out of these games. It isn't about the world ending or a villainous group just being big meanies who want to control everything or some ancient legendary Pokemon being unleashed and you having to stop it. It's a very upbeat story revolving around a school and its students, who sometimes face real-world issues of bullying. Ones who get to know the people around them and form a bond. 
ones who sometimes have parental issues stemming from a shattered home. And all of it feels really good to experience and play through. It's a refreshing look for the series, one that makes me want more of it. The finale only follows suit, bringing you to a location that's been looming in the center of the map for the entire game, and creating one of the coolest regions to explore, one that's steeped in mystery and packed with fun sights to behold. And while some of the story falters and some of the characters fall flat, I genuinely had a fun time with it regardless. I can't stress how much this game pushes the entire series 10 steps forward, while occasionally stepping on glass shards when the issues it has plagues it. The bottom line is this. If you're a diehard Pokemon fan or just don't care about graphical issues, crashes, bugs, and so on, then this game is not worth missing out on. The bad bits are things that have had warning flags for multiple games now and have only manifested as hard as they have given the scope of this game and the lack of time to push it out. And that makes it really hard to give this game a full speed ahead recommendation, because this type of behavior should be punished. And for an entity like the Pokemon Company, that's just not happening. They're making money hand over fist, which is one of the biggest double-edged swords that I've ever seen a company wield against its fan base. On one hand, if the game performs well, we may eventually get a variant that doesn't have these issues at launch. On the other hand, if the game did bomb because of the issues, there's an almost guaranteed chance that we wouldn't see an open-world Pokémon game for a very long time. And that scenario makes this the most difficult game that I've ever had to summarize. We shouldn't be rolling over and taking out our wallets for Game Freak in the hopes that they'll feed us their table scraps of game development but it's so hard to hold on to that attitude when the game turned out the way that it did, at least to me, someone who's been on this ride since 1998. Thanks for watching. I had a really hard time figuring this game out and trying to summarize my feelings on it, but with the state that it's in, I'd say that's going to be hard for anyone. Hopefully I did well enough. I have no idea what I'll be hitting next, but it will be a video game, or at least about video games. Until then, I've got some cool merch over at my shop along with that limited time stuff from earlier. Consider picking some up if you'd like to support me. I've also got a Twitch where I stream nearly every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I've got a Twitter where I tweet out new videos and sometimes other things. I've got a Discord where people chat about stuff that they like and or dislike. And I've got a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.